This is The Convergence. All right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of The Convergence, where every week we talk about Web 3.0, sustainability, and the convergence of those things. Today, I have an old friend on the show. Uh, we I think you were one of my first... Back when I used to do radio shows, even before podcasts were a thing, right. yeah. Tom, I think I think you were like uh, I think 2008 or something like that. You were doing my radio show back then. That sounds Tom, right. What a what, what a what a trip, huh? Uh, you know, it's funny because I tell people all the time when they talk about podcasts, I'm like, you know, the reality is, is I started as a radio show, and then when we started, and I think it was an episode, it was a, it was actually a night you were on the show, and we started getting all these callers outside of our local market, and it was because people were going to the website and listening to the stream of the show. And I was like, wow, that's so unique. And as soon as my contract was up at the radio station, I started doing podcasts. Back then we used to call it blog casts. We didn't even have a term for it. Wow. But uh, well, welcome Tom. It's been a long time. And uh, Tom Zaki is the CEO of TerraCycle. And uh, what are your other companies? TerraCycle, Loop, how does that all work inside that infrastructure? Tom? Yeah, absolutely. So TerraCycle, uh, uh, you know, we've been around for 20 years uh, and uh, we operate in 21 countries and we're uh, a waste management organization, really trying to uh, innovate uh, uh, around waste to try to move from linear to circular systems. And so each mm -hmm. of our divisions is a progression along those ways. TerraCycle's, you know, first and what you would, you know, if anyone knows us, what we uh, we are most known for is collection and recycling of hard to recycle materials. So that's our first division. Let's at least collect and uh, get it recycled. Our second division is focusing on how to help companies make their goods from recycled content. Mm -hmm. Our third division uh, is about reuse and that operates under the Loop brand. And then we even have an emerging division around diagnostics, which is uh, diagnosing the residual matter on waste, uh, like think the, uh, the poop in a diaper or the, mm -hmm. the mold and mildew on an air conditioned filter and so on. And uh, in all these stages, it's about a progression from linear, you know, take, make waste uh, systems into progressively more circular ones. Well, and before the show started, we talked a little bit about how some of these sort of blockchain technologies, people are trying to apply that. And I think it, it's really an emerging field right now. I don't know if it's, it's, it's yet fully defined, but it's interesting to see that, you know, that concept ver versus the centralized versus decentralized that's really happening around NFTs and blockchain right now, where people are saying, look, we want to have a better voice in this process. And for a long time, I mean, I have to be honest, for a long time, you've been pretty much one of the only voices on these uh, hard to recycle items. We met, I think, originally through my work with Earth 911. We were doing all of the really easy to recycle stuff, the motor oils and the plastics and the aluminum cans. And I think back then, your game was the Capri Sun pouches, right? I remember, didn't you used to have a suit that was made out of Capri yeah, Sun? We did, pouches? we did. What a, what a, yeah, that, that, that's a throwback. No, but I mean, it's, you're absolutely right. You know, there's, uh, there's relatively little innovation in the world of waste. I mean, mm. you know, it's incredible to compare like, what we were talking about on, you know, on crypto and blockchain and, you know, and NFTs compared to like that level of staggering innovation compared to, it's almost the exact opposite in the waste industry. I mean, the waste industry yeah. hasn't changed, honestly, since the 1950s. It's basically the same. Well, let's be and, honest, it's gotten yeah. worse in the last 10 years even, right? I mean, well, right, right. Yeah, here in Arizona, you can't even recycle plastic anymore. <laughs> that's right. I think the, the fundamental like business model hasn't evolved. Yeah, What's gotten right. really bad is the underlying economics have degraded which is why we actually see less things being recycled today than yesterday. Yeah, and that, that's a real problem here in Arizona. I, I you know, have had to adjust my recycling because I keep getting notices from the city that they're like, we do not want your plastic. We don't yes. want this stuff. We want your we want your metal cans <laughs> and that's pretty much all they wanna take. They'll take cardboard for now, but for the most part, they don't want it. And it was always the dirty secret anyways, back in the day when I played in this game, um, you know, you'd go tour one of these facilities and you would see them packaging up all this plastic and you're like, oh, are you selling that? And they're like, no, we're taking it to the landfill. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, wh what? So, so how does TerraCycle, I, I understand your business model. For the most part, you're partnering with either communities or, or primarily with the corporation itself, right? Yes. And I think so if we take a step back to the experience yeah. that, you know, you were uh, describing in Arizona, what's so important to note is that a traditional waste management company is not responsible to recycle anything you put into the recycling bin. It's a really important mm -hmm. note because I think as citizens, we think what is recyclable is what we can put in the recycling bin and that recyclers are, are responsible to recycle what we put in the recycling bin. And neither of those things are true. Right. So what makes uh, uh, something uh, uh, recyclable 
uh, is not whether it technically can be recycled. In fact, everything in the world can technically be recycled. What makes something recyclable is whether a garbage company can make money recycling that material. And when you put something in the recycling bin, the, re the a traditional recycler will sort out what they can make money on and will dispose what they cannot make money on. And uh, what you can make money on are the things you said people still want, like, you know, alloys, uh, certain types of plastics, some paper corrugate, but, but it's getting less and less because of the macroeconomic nature, you know, that is suppressing this business equation. And so what we try to do is say, okay, well, look, if economics are the issue, let's go to stakeholders that are willing to fund recycling of things that are otherwise not locally recyclable, which could be a brand like uh, Gillette funding razor blade recycling or Colgate funding oral care recycling. It could be a retailer like uh, Walmart funding, you know, toy recycling or, uh, you know, uh, L'Occitane en Provence funding cosmetic recycling. It could be a, a municipality. It could be uh, even individuals. We have services for any type of stakeholder but someone's got to pay the bill. And when uh, 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 you know, that, 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 that stakeholder funds a TerraCycle program, they're covering whatever it costs us to collect and process the waste minus whatever the recycled material is worth. And with that funding, we can then set up a program uh, uh, or provide a service to recycle almost anything. I mean, not 100% of everything, there's maybe legal sure. requirements around some things, but generally 99% of all, all goods, as long as there's funding, can be recycled. And then the, the important part from there is not to stop there because recycling is not a silver bullet solution. It is uh, mm. a band-aid at best, you know, because right. we live in a very disposable world. From there, it's let's then make goods from recycled content so that there is demand for recycled material and then ultimately shift to reuse. And then, you know, from there, try to consume less. That would be the sort of yeah. general progression we need to take. Well, and I remember back in my days working in the recycling industry, there were different qualities of recycled goods too, right? It was like the PET and the HDPE. People wanted it as long as it hadn't been exposed to certain yes. chemicals, a lot of those kind of things. You, you've gone much farther than that though. I mean, we're talking about diapers, we're talking about cigarettes, all, and you're not making those into water bottles. Let's just make that really clear. Or yeah. maybe you are now, I don't know. Uh, but not, not, not those two things, but we are yeah, there's food grade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so how do you, I mean, in those instances, you're working with a, a material that for the most part is the pressure coming from stakeholders. Is that why these companies are engaging or, or is it true? You know, maybe, maybe they're coming to a realization that they need to be more sustainable or how does that sort of yeah. work? I think, you know, in the end, the, what I've really learned in the past 20 years with corporations is they are a mirror to our desires. Right. Yes. So what we buy, I mean, they're out there trying to figure out what we want and giving us yeah. what we want in the most convenient, affordable and awesome way possible. That's mm. really a mirror to our desires. And the really best corporations mirror our future desires, not just our current desires. But that's about as good as innovation gets. No one's out there trying to sell us what we don't want. And desires goes further than the object or service we're buying. If we, the people, care about, you know, climate change, what happens? Mm. Corporations react and they That's, create, yeah. you know, all sorts of responses, you know, to, you know, carbon trading and climate yeah. change, you know, and start measuring their phase, you know, their, their scope one, two, three, and how to mitigate that and put all these commitments out and then follow through on them. But if we change, you know, if we stop focusing on that, those initiatives go away. So we, the people, uh, are the ones who determine where companies are going to focus by what we care about, what we um, complain about what we uh, reward with our purchase. And, you know, that is, I think, the ultimate act of democracy, right? It's not to say <laughs> yeah. that all the responsibility is on the consumer, but right. the consumer, the individual is the one who, uh, 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 through their desire, is amplifying uh, or, uh, or eliminating options. Yeah, and I think that's so important, and it really ties into the to the blockchain sort of conversation that a lot of times we have on this show. The decentralized these DAO organizations now, decentralized autonomous organizations, mm -hmm. can only form them in Wyoming right now. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the only state that works with it. But this, these decentralized organizations are really interesting because you can essentially create a shareholder structure where it's not based upon how many shares you have for your vote, but you could literally, I'm working on a project right now, you could literally have an energy drink that is part of a DAO that the purchaser becomes part of this company and they can help determine the next flavor yeah. or the next iteration or what happens to it at end of life. Is sustainability important to that consumer? If it is, then they have that ability to vote in this decentralized, you know, autonomous sort of way. And I think there are, there's a lot of innovation that's coming from that or will be coming from that in the next few years. So I'm excited to see how that plays out, right? 
So I want to talk with you for a few moments about Evergreen Carbon Credits, one of the sponsors of this show. I started working with Evergreen when I was telling a friend of mine who's involved with that company about my efforts to try to learn more about blockchain, NFTs, crypto, all the things in this space. And he uh, showed me Evergreen. Evergreen was a really unique solution. I've looked at carbon credits in the past. I've been in the sustainability industry for almost 15 years. I understood what they were. They were, you were buying an offset to offset the carbon footprint that you or your company has. But I also understood the challenges with that. They're sold in very, very large blocks. And then people break those blocks up and try to sell individual credits or small clusters of credits to uh, businesses. And, and that creates some room for, um, for, for, for fraud, for people to not be up and up on what that project is, uh, if that carbon credit is real. And, and there's you know, challenges with that. And you can Google it right now and find there's a big case in Europe going on about fraudulent carbon credits. But what Evergreen did, I thought was really unique. They took this idea of NFTs and they took blocks of carbon credits and broke those things down into tens of thousands or even millions of individual carbon credits. They can actually fraction those even out to a tenth of a carbon credit if they needed to. And they were able to then create a smart contract around that carbon credit so that you can track it back to its origin. You can find out what project it was associated with, but you are also guaranteed that the carbon credits you're getting from Evergreen are the real deal. You get that certificate, you get that certification that only the blockchain can do. So that's why it made sense for them to come on as a sponsor of this show. We're talking about all this new technology and with new technology comes higher energy usages in some senses. And Evergreen is here to help offset that. If you wanna to look to maybe improve your image in the marketplace, maybe you're looking to offset some of your carbon footprint, not even just for your image, but actually for the sake of the planet, head on over to evergreencarboncredits.com and check out what they do. You can buy credits for as little as $11 and uh, you'll get the certificate and the NFT that you can put in your wallet that shows that you've actually made that contribution. And that money, particularly right now with the projects they're working on, is going to reforestation in the Amazon. I think that's something we can all uh, really get behind, particularly when we understand that the the environment, the climate, is we're all connected to it. It doesn't matter if uh, we're putting off uh, emissions here in the U.S. Or, or if it's happening in Mexico. It all contributes to the same global problem. So why not be part of a global solution with Evergreen Carbon Credits? You, you guys have been doing this for a long, long time. <laughs> I mean, what'd you say, 21 countries? That's right. That's 21 right. countries around the world. And what are sort of the craziest things you are recycling right now? Is it the baby diapers and the cigarette butts that we uh, always throw out there? Yeah, you know, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's all of that. I think to me, what's exciting is, I mean, there's all the weird, you know, short, like yeah. sex toys or cigarette butts yeah, or uh, yeah, chewing gum, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go for the things that are a bit more taboo and get people sort of to, you know, to stand up. But to me, what's really interesting is if you take something like a diaper, how it can go through the progression of those stages from mm -hmm. recycling to recycled content reuse and all the way. So you take diapers, right? We are doing diaper recycling uh, mm -hmm. in a number of countries from Japan to France. But uh, we're also working with diaper companies on how do they in integrate waste into the diaper. So they're making oh. it from recycled content, which is, you know, uh, more novel. Um, mm -hmm. We even just with Procter & Gamble launched uh, diapers into our loop platform so that you can get uh, in the Northeast today, but by the summertime nationally, a reusable diaper service to your home, you know, where instead ah. of uh, throwing them away, they just get picked up, cleaned, and then sent back to you. And then with uh, another major diaper brand, we're actually developing uh, a service for uh, diagnostics where you'll be able to buy a little kit by the end of this year, put one soiled diaper into it and then send it. It doesn't go to a uh, recycling facility or a cleaning facility. It goes to a laboratory that analyzes the microbiome in the fecal sample and sends you back or gives you access, if you will, to this incredibly rich wellness platform that helps you, you know, guide, uh, uh, you know, you as a parent on how you should help your child have the very, very best, uh, uh, you know, sort of gut bacteria, you know, through diet and other things. Because we, you know, establish our bacterial loads in our uh, tummies, you yeah. know, by our third year. After that, they don't evolve. Wow. That, that, that is a fascinating approach. And, and I think this is the thing I've always liked about you, Tom, is you don't think about things in the one way how you can make money or one way how you can resolve a problem, but you come at it from multiple different perspectives. And I think even your TV show, how many, how many years of 
Yes, we did uh, four seasons. Four seasons. Four seasons. We, uh, we're actually out there now, you know, pitching uh, again. So maybe we'll uh, we'll bring it back. We haven't done it for a little while, but yeah, we did four four seasons on uh, National Geographic Channel and then the Pivot Channel. Yeah, and I think that show was very innovative too because you you were bringing things in and trying to solve really difficult problems. I think the Capri Sun story was always one I, I really enjoyed because it was you know collection at, fr from elementary school kids for the most part, right? That's and right. then turning it into products that they could go and buy at the local Walmart, which I thought was really fascinating. Maybe tell a little bit more about that and how how you yeah. came up with that idea and how that worked. Absolutely. So you know when uh, when we sort of started thinking about how do we recycle hard to recycle materials, what we realized that every waste stream is like a different animal, but mm -hmm. they have similarities, like animals have similarities. And in, in, in waste, you have to figure out how to collect it, how to process it, and then how to drive that business model. So mm -hmm. collection can be things like, what is the physical device it's collected in? The devices we collect cigarette butts in have to be flame retardant. The ones that we collect diapers in have to, you know, bear smell and uh, be <laughs> yeah. able to trap the smell. Something like a Capri Sun, you know, it's a little less challenging. We also have to think about where is the collection? So we always found that certain waste streams aggregate at different points. We collect contact lenses with Bosch and Loam at optometrists, but we collect pet food bags at animal shelters and uh, pets, you know, pet food or, or pet stores. We yeah. collect juice pouches at schools, you know? So each waste stream may aggregate at a different location. I always love to tell people, you know, when you look in your garbage can at home, it looks very mixed, but look in a garbage can at a tennis court. What do you see? Tennis balls, tennis ball packaging, and maybe an odd water bottle. And that's it. Yeah, if you true. look at the garbage in a movie theater, what do you see? Well, you probably see popcorn containers and, you know, but you see it gets very narrow, the spectrum mm -hmm. of waste when you move away from the home and you look at waste in certain locations, they become very defined. And uh, so you have to figure out, you know, in what, how, what is the logistics pattern to collect it and all those different things. So that's what we think about when we think about the waste stream. And the second is how do we process it? Mm -hmm. Can we reuse it? Can we upcycle it? Can we recycle it? Do we do that through mechanical measures? Do we do it through chemical recycling measures? And it's blending these sort of technologies together to make sure we can get the highest value output for the material. So like Capri Sun pouches, as you mentioned, you can upcycle them by sewing them together and making things like backpacks. But when you collect a huge volume, you can only sew so many together. So the balance are used for things like, uh, like uh, plastic products, like plastic decking and so on. Sure. I remember actually uh, being at your office and I think it was Capri Sun vouchers. You guys used to have these Gaylord bins of Capri Sun vouchers. Sure. But the other thing that I noticed, which was really interesting, was these rolls, like the end pieces from rolls from the factory. Yes. Right? Where where it was either a miscut or, I mean, anybody that's ever been in, a, there's always trimming, right? There's always stuff that comes off the end. So so it wasn't, to your, to your point, it wasn't just, hey, pull this out of the garbage can. It was actually going back to the manufacturer and saying, what's the waste that you produce as well? And how can we incorporate that into this? And there's a lot less ants on that stuff. <laughs> Well, no, certainly. And I always I notice with Capri Sun, there's well, a lot of exactly. ants around that. that well, sure, yeah. you know, you're absolutely right. And so post-consumer waste, you know, is the is the used material, right? And that's where everything yeah. ends up at, right? Every yeah. pouch that leaves the factory, every toothpaste tube, every, you know, uh, mascara wand will become waste at the end of its life. And that's the post-consumer. That's the juggernaut. And it's also yeah. more dirty. It's been used, you know, yeah. and around the block, you know, dare I say. Yeah. But there's a huge amount of waste at the factory level too. Product that, uh, you know, packaging that cannot, you know, be used. Maybe it's misprinted. Maybe the inks are a bit off. You know, maybe uh, it didn't fill properly on the line. Maybe it did fill, but the product has expired or is not sellable, you know, and uh, or product returns. You know, most product returns go to destruction as well uh, and are not resold. So there's a, you know, there's a lot that comes behind the scenes. And this is why it's very difficult to escape waste because even if you live a zero waste life, right, uh, in quotes, yeah. and you, you know, maybe you are only buying, like I, when I go to supermarket, I'm only buying, you know, fruits and vegetables, you know, that's it. But even if I buy an apple, and I think that's a zero waste experience, that apple came, you know, probably in a crate that was probably packaged in a truck, that farm that it came from had agricultural film and all sorts of, you know, plastics and so on to produce the tree, right? So it's all there. Uh, it just may be in a way that is invisible to us. Yeah, and I remember doing this at Walmart with doing waste consulting, and I know you, you've done a lot of work with him as yeah. well, but going out in the back and dumping out dumpsters and looking at all the different things that yeah. come through the supply chain that never get sold to an end customer, but recognizing, and I always like that about Walmart is their perspective was it's lost money. Yeah, yeah, it might be our vendor that paid for it, 
but do you think they didn't charge us <laughs> in the process? So if we can find ways to reduce this amount of waste, not only does it reduce the cost for the vendors, which potentially reduces their cost, but also it costs something to throw garbage away. You know, we we forget at our homes, it might cost us, I, mean, I think here in Tempe, it's $75 a, a quarter to get rid of waste, which is pretty expensive. Uh, but but imagine if you're if you're a Walmart and you've got tens of thousands of locations and dumpsters and all sorts of waste. The more waste you reduce, the more profit comes into the organization. And I always have to remind people that's not revenue; that's bottom line profit. It's not it's dollar for dollar profitability that comes to the bottom line. And I think that's the cool thing about what you provide is that ability to to offset some of that. Um, and, and then how, how do companies go out and tell that story? Do you go out and tell that story with them? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, the first part is to get a stakeholder to fund this externality, right? And right. to say, I'm going to take some voluntary responsibility, whether it's recycling or recycled content or reuse or all of them or some of them. And uh, that's the first part. And, you know, getting these platforms up and running, right? Doing the R&D, making sure everything is, you know, functioning, and then we launch it. And then we try to drive awareness on it. We do that through, you know, talking to the media like yourself or any other way that we can get the word out, whether it's our books or TV show or, or, uh, or PR. And then the brands amplify in their own way. You know, maybe they uh, put the message on their package. Maybe they put it on their website and social media, uh, maybe even some cases advertising, whatever methods they have at their disposal and they're willing to invest in to try to get the word out. Because in the end, again, it comes back to the consumer. You know, we can be a platform, the brands can fund it, but then citizens have to use it. And our job at TerraCycle is to constantly encourage brands to put in as much resource as possible. And then we use that resource to make the programs as convenient and accessible as we can. You know, it's the brand's job to fund it and amplify it. And then it's the consumer's job is to use it and make sure companies, you know, know that this is important, you know, to, to individuals uh, so that the companies hear that and keep growing them uh, uh, and maintaining them. That's amazing. So let's talk about, you know, you've been doing this now for 20 years. Um, obviously, probably more than anybody, you can see the trajectory of recycling. Yeah. Where do you see this going in the next five years? What's happening in the sustainability world? You know me, I tend to dip in and out a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. in electric vehicles one month. I'm you know, doing something else. But you've really been like pedal to the metal now for 20 years. Where do you see this going? Yeah. What's the trend and what's the trend line, I guess? It's so interesting. You know, the, the biggest disconnect in all of the circular economy space, if you look at recycling, is this weirdness that manufacturers do not need to review their products or packages with the waste industry. And think about that. It may seem like, why would they? But when you release a drug, the FDA has to approve it, you know, to be sold to consumers. Yeah. Right. So we are producing things, products and packages that we don't ask the end of life managers on, do they like it or not? <clears throat> and then the end of life managers have no legal responsibility to do anything good with it. And that's a fundamental disconnect because one engine is relying on another, but they have no responsibility to each other. Hmm. Right. And that that's the big disconnect. And I think that disconnect is, is very pervasive and it's going to continue you know, to be there. And as such, the actors on both sides are only doing what is profitable to them. Yeah. Right. And it's that is what's driving it. Now, if you look at the macroeconomic trends, uh, they are not positive. Right. Uh, and markets have been hard to access since China shut down exportation yep. or importation. Um, you know, oil, I mean, oil is a little bit more expensive now, but it used to be very cheap. That doesn't help. And, yeah. you know, the quality of waste vis-a-vis -vis how profitable it is to recycle is also decreasing. And so it's a progressively harder business. You know, recycling is a tough business, very heavy capital investment uh, and low margin. Uh, generally speaking. And yep. now what is good news, right? That's the sort of zeitgeist over the past 10 years. But the good news is the world is waking up, you know, really starting in 2018, you know, a lot of things. Greta came onto the scene, uh, Blue Planet yeah. 2 was aired, uh, and many other inputs, you know, the turtle with the straw up its nose was trending on yeah. uh, social media. All these things came together that citizens really woke up and there's way more um, uh, public outcry for, you know, uh, responsible solutions, uh, you know, to the waste issue. So there's a good amount of tailwind driven by citizens. And we're seeing that come out in more legislation. Uh, U.S. finally passed EPR in Maine and Oregon. And I think yeah. other states will follow. There's legislation like Seattle banning the straw and other examples, yeah. you know, uh, New Jersey just banned the plastic bag. Um, and more, you know, so more examples of making disposable consumption more challenging. Uh, uh, making uh, 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 circular consumption, you know, more uh, incentivized. These are all coming. Um, and so I think that the while the macro sort of state is challenging, this push is only going to help push things in the right direction. And I think it's going to be a blend of legislative action 
as well as private voluntary action that will be then, you know, uh, uh, um, let's say applauded by consumers choosing product yeah. A over product B. But I think mm -hmm. there's a long way to go. And I also think recycling is not the silver bullet answer. It is just a step in the way. We have to move to the way the world used to be, which is reusable, uh, sharing, you know, repairing, you know, these sort of things so that we honor the most destructive aspect, you know, from an environmental point of view, the mining and the farming, the creation of goods. You know, everyone always gets hung up on transportation. Transportation is not the impact of this T-shirt, even if this was made in China. I don't know, but let's just sure. say it was. The most of the environmental impact in this T-shirt is turning soil into cotton and then weaving the cotton into a T-shirt. Hmm. And that is what, you know, for me, then it's much better to honor this T-shirt and wear it for decades then repair yeah. it and have someone else wear it instead of like have wear it for a month and then throw it out and buy another one. Yeah. And that's so difficult because we, we live in a society where we have been trained to consume. And even when there's economic downturn, what's the first thing the government does is try to I give us money that. so we consume more. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and this has been a, this has been a real challenge and it's something that I've, I think my journey in the 15 plus years that I've been involved in the game of sustainability as well has changed because you know, for a long time, I thought it was about education. And I thought, you know, if we just educate people, they'll come around. Now I'm much more about the innovation game. I'm like, look, I don't need you to, I don't need you to care about the planet. I just need somebody to fix it. Um, and, and and that's difficult too. I, I mentioned on another episode, I had a dinner party with some friends that were here that were all environmentalists. And I played a little trick on them. And I said, hey, have you heard that there's a new uh, carbon capture technology? It'll be out in the next five years. It's going to completely solve the entire issue. We don't have to worry about climate change anymore. We can pollute as, as much as we want. And everybody was like totally appalled. They were just like... Oh, like you thought they were gonna have a heart attack. And I'm like, yeah, but we have the solution. And they're like, yeah, but 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 we want the cause. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's th th then you weren't in it for the right reason in the first place. And I do think innovation has to become a part of this because people, you know, I think we've all learned in 20 years that people are slow to change. Maybe maybe, maybe they will change, but they'll do it so slowly that maybe we have to just innovate instead. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on that education versus yeah. innovation? You've been an innovator, so yeah, tell no, me your look, thoughts. I think um, education is, is important, but it's something that you have to keep the drumbeat going because A, people forget, and there's new people born every day. Yeah. And so, you know, with education, it's a constant, constant reinforcing uh, that it needs to occur. So there has to be some baseline there. I think innovation is important, and I think your point is really astute, is that innovation has to be downhill, not uphill. Um, in other words, it has to be more convenient, easier, play into our desires, not, you know, into our aspirations. And desires are downhill, aspirations are uphill. You have to play, I think, innovation downhill, right? You know, sure. what's getting everyone in, you know, in mobility to move to electric is not for the environment. It's, it's a better vehicle now, yeah. right? Back when it was the Prius, it was a sacrifice for the environment. You spent sure. more and you got a, basically a Civic that was 50% more expensive than the petrol one. And you did it for the environment. Now with electric vehicles being faster, just better, people are you know gravitating and you know petroleum vehicles will be gone, long gone. But it's playing downhill. The plant-based yeah. protein market, very similar. Now the burgers yeah. just taste great and so on. Yeah, they do. I think we really have to do that. But then this goes to a bigger point. I don't think either education or innovation is the answer. I think there's only one answer out there and that is a massive reduction of consumption. Because it doesn't matter how we uh, you know, what we consume, if we consume too much, it doesn't matter how green yeah. ethical, you know, you name it, it is how innovative. And look, that's all we do here is innovate. We have to reduce our, our net consumption because we just consume as people way too much. And I think it's going to come in one of two ways, but it's going to come without any question. It will yeah, either. Right. It's going to come <clears throat> involuntarily where it's going to come through suffering. Uh, you know, more environmental catastrophes, rising, raising prices, you know, like think about just the simplicity on climate change. It's yeah. going to make farming more challenging. More areas will become, you know, desert, uh, you know, deserts and so on, yeah. which means the price of food will go up. And what happens is the price of everything goes up, we consume less. So it's either going to come through pain and suffering, but not just our pain and suffering, the suffering of animals and plants and, you know, mm -hmm. all these other things that are caught up, innocently caught up in our decisions, or it's going to come voluntarily which will um, reduce the amount of pain and suffering. And that's gonna be, I think, the key question for humanity is, and this is, I think, the key question of, can are humans really special? Can we rise above our desire hmm. and modulate down? Or are we just like you know anything else that will gouge itself on sugar if there's sugar in front of it? 
Boy, that's so true. And and it makes me wonder sometimes about folks like Elon Musk is, you know, with with the innovation that he's trying to create around SpaceX, is it's like, you know, it is the real intention. He knows we're screwed <laughs> and we better become, we better find other planets because we've already done too much and maybe the next one we'll learn our lessons on. I sure hope that isn't the case. Well, I don't but, get the logic there. I mean, Mars is, is sort of the end yeah. of the uh, climate change saga. I would still rather start yeah. with a very... Um, very challenged earth than a, than a complete desert, yeah. you know, uh, planet. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and I do think though, I think, you know, some of the comments I've heard from him recently about that is looking at Mars as a jumping off point, you know, for more exploration. Sure, sure. But, well, that, but that, I mean, that, that is, is general exploration to find a uh, utopia somewhere. Yeah. You know, which, which would sort of suck. I mean, I guess if we think about the, the size of the universe and, you know, are, are there other intelligent species out there, uh, you know, have, have they made this same mistake and screwed up the first one? You know, um, I, 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 I sure hope that we can rise above that, but, but certainly, you know, 20 years of watching the trends in this industry, and I don't think it's getting much better, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, completely destroy the world. I think the question is, what sort of future do we leave for the people, you know, we care about and we care most about ourselves, our children, you know, humanity. I think we care much less about planets and, uh, oh, sorry, about plants and animals, certainly yeah. about plants. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think in the end, you know, Earth and nature is incredibly resilient. It'll come back. The question yeah. is, you know, the effect on us. And I think this is the real, it's you know, it's, it's like we're looking at an addiction, right? And we're like, a, you know, like a really addicted, um, you know, individual. You pick the addiction, you know, alcohol yeah. or drugs, doesn't yeah. matter. And the question is, do we just keep partying till we, you know, till we, you know, till we die? Uh, or can we, you know, go into rehab and can we sort of bring ourselves around? And, and, and the answer here, the addiction is to consumption. Let's be so clear. Yeah. Right. It is to consumption and consumption is not just physical goods. It's the consumption of mobility. It's the, cons you know, it's how big our homes are. I, I'm guilty to it too. Right? Yeah, yeah I am too. I just came and, back from Hawaii, right? Just for a four day trip, just because it was like, we should go, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think this is what we have to culturally think about because business can't get here. Business is a reflection of our desires. Right. Yeah. And so we need to think about modulating our desires and then business will modulate. Hmm. Boy, that's a powerful point. I mean, I, I even think about it here with my home. You know, I think it, during COVID, you, you look at a couple of my clients are in the remodeling, you know, and construction industry. And and during COVID, people nested. But what did they nest? They built a better nest. Mm -hmm. You know, so where their travel went down, where all of these other things went down. You know, I guess that's just such a great question is, is this an, is, is this our nature to do this or or is, has it been nurtured into us? Um, um Probably both, but I think it's deep in our nature because, you know, if you think about animalistic traits, it's about, you know, it, 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 it's about, yeah. you know, hoarding calories, hoarding for survival. Yeah. It's just right now, all that stuff is very cheap for us. We don't have to, I mean, think about it. Yeah. A hundred years ago, if you wanted to have a uh, sweater, you, yeah. it would probably be a very Serious. big percentage of your salary that month. Yeah. And it was a big percentage because someone had to grow a sheep nearby. They had to take the wool, make it in, weave it, all this stuff. Today, a sweater is like what? You know, uh, a cheap one could be 10 sure. minutes of work. Yeah, sure. No, I think that's a really good point. And I think, I think that's part of the challenge that we have is things like water, we don't properly calculate the cost of. Yeah. You know, we, we, we subsidize that. And, and I look at that here even in Arizona. I mean, we're going through a massive drought here on the West Coast. And there's all sorts of talk from politicians on what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But yet, the guy across the street has an acre full of grass. You know? well, and, this should and the, be the pricing externalities, right? Like we're right, not exactly. pricing. Uh, I think that's like the biggest thing sustainability folks will say yeah. is that we don't pay for our externalities. So it's like taking yeah. credit card debt on our externalities. And yeah. if there is a drought environment, easy answer, modulate the price of water. And then if yeah. the gentleman across the street wants to have a green lawn, he'll spend a lot of money for it. And you know what? That's exactly. his privilege. Free market exactly. like America. Yeah. Great. Right. But price yep. it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're so right. I mean, it's just, there's so many of those things that we just don't think about that we, we have so much subsidized, you know, subsidies in our lives, as well as we subsidize so many companies that go and pump water or or do these things and don't have any cost to it. Yeah. Um, but this has been a great conversation, Tom. It always is with you. Uh, you know, I remember we used to talk about warm poop a lot back in the old days. That's right. You know, That's where, right. Where, where you got your start. But listen, thank you so much for being uh, here on the show. I think it gives a great perspective to people about where these technologies and where innovation needs to happen in the marketplace. 
as well as to your point, you know, some of the pressure that's going to be coming on us uh, here in the relatively near future because of our overconsumption and how that's going to affect you know, our lives and, uh, and our pocketbooks going forward. I mean, if you think there's been inflation because of supply chain problems, oh, yeah. wait till we start to run out of water and the price of water gets inflated, uh, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 times what it is today. Tom, how can people find you? Is it still TerraCycle? Is that yeah, the best yeah, way to find it? You can visit uh, TerraCycle.com and check out, we just actually relaunched the website. So there's some really cool nice. things there. And uh, yeah, absolutely nice. check that out. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. Okay, folks. Well, until next time. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks for listening to The Convergence. If you want more information about the topics you've heard here today, reach out to us at theconvergencepodcast.com.